Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Brookings webinar on the presidential transition process. Um, I want to remind everyone that viewers can submit questions for speakers via email to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter using hashtag transition2021. In 1963, Congress passed the Presidential Transition Act, which has been amended twice in 2016 and again in 2020. Under the act, GSA, the General Service Administration, will provide money for offices, staff, and other services associated with a presidential transition. The act requires agencies to begin transition planning before the election by designating a career official to be in charge of it. And it requires the FBI to conduct security clearances expeditiously for the new president's national security team. And it requires that agencies prepare to brief the incoming president's teams, among other things. The act is triggered by the director of the General Services Administration. And until a few weeks ago, no one knew who that was. And that's because this transition has gotten underway very, very, very slowly, unlike most previous modern transitions. 2020, a year full of surprises in so many ways, didn't see the presidential transition begin until November 23rd, three weeks after election day, and two weeks and two days after the Saturday on which it became very clear that Joe Biden had won a majority in the Electoral College. Even after the GSA made the announcement, Trump appointees still were slow to participate. There were reports of political appointees sitting in on Biden transition team briefings with career staff, reports of information being blocked, and other kind of unusual involvement by political officials. And of course, even today, as the electors are meeting in state capitals to cast the electoral college votes that will make Joe Biden president, uh, the incumbent president still hasn't conceded the presidential election. So this is a pretty unusual transition. And to help me unpack this, I have with me three experienced scholars, Lisa Brown, Katie Tempest, and John Hudak. Lisa is currently president, vice president, and general counsel at Georgetown University. I first met Lisa when she worked as counsel to Vice President Al Gore. After a hiatus at the American Constitution Society, she joined the Obama administration and served in several high-level jobs, the most important of which, for our purposes today, was as co-director of the agency review for the Obama-Biden transition team. John Hudak, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director at the Center for Effective Public Management here at Brookings, is an expert on the relationships between presidents and the bureaucracy. Well known for a great book called Presidential Pork, which is gonna help anybody understand what the stakes are in this transition. And finally, Katie Dunn Tempest, who is a non-resident senior fellow here at Brookings. You may know her for her work on the presidential personnel tracker that we've been running here at Brookings for several, uh, for more than a year now. Um, she's also been a member of the White House Project, which pre prepared reports to the 2000 and 2008 presidential transitions. In addition, she has a book called Presidents as Candidates, inside the White House for the presidential campaign. So with, with these three great scholars here, uh, let's get started. And the first question I wanna pose is, does it matter? What, if any, are the consequences to this most unusual presidential transition? Lisa, why don't we start with you? Uh, thanks, Elaine, and thanks for having me. It's great to be here today. It, and the short answer is it definitely matters. If you think about it, on a transition has an average of 75 days between election day and inauguration day to get, your hand, to get their hands around what is going on in every single agency in the government. 
it is a massive amount of work in a short period of time. And if you think about it, no business would ever think to have their entire senior leadership leave on the same day. And the only reason that you can, that the government can do that is because of the cooperation of the outgoing administration and because of the incredible work of career employees. And until election day, the transition cannot actually get into the agencies, Elaine, as you um, indicated, which means they can't get classified briefings. If you think about the big issues today on COVID, what you want is you want the Biden team in there talking to CDC, talking to DOD about their distri the distribution plans. You want to make sure that when Biden takes office, when he becomes president, no longer president-elect, they hit the ground running on COVID. And then similarly, the other area where you worry in particular is um, national security, because you don't want any gaps in terms of handover from one administration to the next. And we learned this lesson the hard way um, when President Bush took office after Bush v. Gore. And their transition was, I think, shortened to about 45 days. And the 9-11 Commission actually said that they pointed to the late transition and the inability of President Bush to get his full team into place as one of the causes of 9-11. So now one of the other practical things that you're seeing right now is background checks are backed up because you can't start those until for the election as well, which means, and that's always a bottleneck. Katie can talk to this more, but it's a very practical um, block right now. And even though I think Vice President now former vice president, now president-elect Biden and his team are tremendously experienced. That will help, but it doesn't make up for the gap in time. Good. Uh, Katie, can you expand on this a little bit more and particularly the issue with the FBI clearances? Sure. Well, if you think about it, there are roughly 4,000 political appointments that need to be made when a new administration takes office. Of those 4,000, roughly 2,100 require Senate confirmation. And that means that several of them, or thousands of them, are going to need FBI background checks. In addition, White House staffers that are allowed to have access to classified materials also need FBI background checks and clearance checks in order so that so that they may see those materials. So you know, it's you know, people think, oh, you know, it was just three weeks later, but those three weeks matter, especially when you only have 78 days total. Losing three weeks is a huge proportion of that time. And, and, and most people will tell you who have worked on transitions when I've conducted interviews and such, they say 78 days is hardly enough time. So imagine that that time has already been truncated by three weeks. Uh, it's a problem. And those FBI checks could have been started on November 4th. Uh, instead, it was much later. And so there could be a backup, which is completely in contrary to the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. Um, you know, and Katie, let, let me drill down a bit. I, I It was my impression that after the 9-11 Commission's recommendations that there was some change in the law to require expeditious background checks. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? What's the difference between an expedition check and a regular check? Is it they put everybody else aside and take the, the yeah. president-elect's team first? What's happening there? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, it sounds, your explanation sounds right. Lisa, do you have insight on this? You no, know, all I know is they mandated that, so that. required that the president elect get classified briefings immediately after the election. But in this area, they encouraged the expeditious. I see. <laughs> they, and they basically said, try to get them done before inauguration day for the national security team. So it's not a mandate. Oh, it's they not labeled. a mandate. It's, it's, a, it's an encouragement, right? Um, in, in, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, and in prior administrations, there was always a great deal of cooperation. Um, the, yeah. the transition from uh, President George W. Bush to Obama is held out as the gold standard, where they prepared heavily in advance for the Obama people, and it seemed as though it was a seamless transition. Now we're finding pockets of dissent. So not only do we have this three-week delay, we also have these pockets of dissent that complicate things even more. You know, Katie and Elaine, um, we actually got the letter from GSA, the ascertainment letter at nine o'clock in the morning, the day after the election. So I was actually in GSA meeting the formal start, literally the day after the election with our folks going into agencies soon thereafter. That was in, it, that was in 2000. That was, sorry, that was 2000. That was the transition that Katie's talking about for me. Right. Bush, yeah, that's absolutely right. Complete cooperation from the Bush. And John, what's your, what's your perspective on this in the, in the broader context of things? What, is, what does this mean? Is it as, it is 
how bad is it? Okay, how yeah. dangerous is it? So I, I think there's two parts to this. Um, th there's a, a positive side and then then a really negative side. And Lisa touched on the positive side. That is that uh, Joe Biden is better prepared for a truncated transition th than probably any president we've had in, in the past, except maybe George H.W. Bush, at least in, in, in modern times. And the reason for that is um, he has he knows how to staff a White House. As vice president for eight years, he's been there. He understands what that organization looks like. He probably also understands what he would have wanted to do differently that, than what President Obama did in terms of organization. And so he's ready to hit the ground running and he's only been out of power for four years, right? It's not like when Bill Clinton came to office in 1992 and Democrats hadn't been in power for 12 years, a lot changes structurally in the White House, a lot changes structurally in the bureaucracy uh, to be able to get caught up. Plus, of course, President Clinton and Vice President Gore um, had not served in White Houses before. And, and, and so in, in that sense, there is, it, it's unfortunate that it's truncated, but if you had to essentially pick anyone who was running on the Democratic side in 2020 to face that type of transition, Joe Biden would have been the person. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a broader issue of institutional decay um, that, that exists here. And if this is the new normal, this idea that you can test an election that is clearly lost, um, that you disregard the national security elements of a transition, uh, the, the basic functional elements of a transition, and the ability of a new administration to meet the goals and the issues of the day, if we're doing away with that, we're doing serious harm uh, to the Republic. Uh, we're doing serious harm to the ability of the United States to do what it needs to do and a president to do what he or she needs to do. And so when we look at this year in particular, uh, a lot of presidents or some presidents come to office with crises on their plate. President Obama, as, as Lisa well knows, she was there, was dealing with uh, the worst uh, financial uh, a financial crisis and the worst recession since the Great Depression. Um, that was very serious and needed to be addressed quickly. We now have the worst recession since the Great Depression again. Um, we have instability in the Middle East. Um, we have obviously a global pandemic that uh, no one in serving in government has dealt with before. These are all massive, major issues that the American public expects President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, to do effective work on. And this truncated transition is just crippling their ability to do that as quickly as they could have been able to. Great. Okay. Now let me let me ask you you all the the broader question. How do you explain this? Trump has lost every, almost every single lawsuit, I think, but one that he and his allies have tried. The Supreme Court has turned him down twice, rather clearly and abruptly. Um, the Electoral College is voting today, and and he's going to win. There is a kind of a fanciful notion that somehow he can bring this up in the House of Representatives and they might vote otherwise. I sincerely doubt it. Um, why is Trump doing this? What's happening? John, you want to start this off? What, what's, what's going on in, in his mind? Sure. I, I think it's sort of the answer is the precursor to my last answer about institutional decay. And the reality is uh, Donald Trump as a candidate and Donald Trump as president has not really cared for the institutions of government. He is, um, he is the state, um, right? He considers himself a one-man operation and the rest of the government is there just to serve whatever his goals are um, and not that he is there to serve those institutions and help those institutions work. And so, you know, when we take a step back, we've seen concession speeches from candidates that are brutally painful. Uh, before this panel, um, we were talking about uh, Vice President Gore's concession in 2000, Hillary Clinton's concession um, in 2016, very difficult moments uh, for those, those two candidates, um, but necessary moments. And I think when we look back in 2016, um, Hillary Clinton lost um, a combined three states by about the same amount that Donald Trump lost by this time. Uh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote by significantly more this time. Uh, and Hillary Clinton's uh, margin of loss in the Electoral College is, was about what Donald Trump's margin of loss will be in the Electoral College this time. But the morning after the election, Hillary Clinton conceded, in part 
uh, because she respected the institutions of government and the importance of the peaceful transfer of power. And I think sort of a, a, a double reflection of that, that um, appreciation for the institutions. Um, Hillary Clinton is today casting her vote um, for Joe Biden as an elector from the state of New York. She and President Clinton um, were both electors and they cast their votes earlier. Um, and, and she actually posted about it on social media and she said, we need to get rid of the electoral college, but as long as it's here, I'm going to fill this role. And I think it's, it, it's a remarkable moment to say, even when you disagree with an institution, you respect that that is how the system works and you operate within that structure. Well, and, and let, let me just do a little bit of advertisement. John and I have written a piece on the Brookings website saying how to get rid of the Electoral College, which I hope people will look at because today is, is a day to, to consider that. John, let me just ask you one more thing. What about Georgia? Okay, what about those Georgia Senate races? Do you think that's playing into this drama we're seeing from the White House? You know, I, it, it's hard to say. I, I think so. Um, but the strategy that the Republican Party is taking in Georgia by, by dragging this out is one approach to keep people motivated. But the problem is that the president, um, some of the president's allies, um, so, uh, certainly social media supporters, including a new social media platform, uh, is undermining that. It is not saying uh, get out to vote, go deliver these Senate seats for Republicans, keep that Senate as a check on, on Joe Biden. They're saying the system is corrupt, so why bother? Yeah. Uh, and and that is the worst Lisa, approach. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. It, it is confusing. Lisa, what do you think is happening? Uh, what do you think is going on with Trump and, and this, this protracted fight? So I think John really did hit it on the nose here. I think um, from the very beginning, Trump hasn't believed in government, right? He's been a disruptor. He has been, you know, every process, you know, I served as staff secretary in the White House and my job was to have material go to the president in an orderly fashion so that you, you wanted to make sure that one person couldn't get in there and, and get their view with the president without other people weighing in. This president values having that sort of disruption. He doesn't want order. And he just doesn't value government. And I think the one thing that you're seeing, uh, you've seen in the past from other administrations is that there's a real loyalty to the government, to the processes, to democratic niceties. And that has led them, you know, President Bush, as we were talking about, he didn't want any balls dropped in between the administrations. Mm -hmm. And balls dropped, Trump loves that. He loves to, that whole disruption is something that he's really thrived on. So unfortunately, he is not, there's, he isn't incentivized in any way to be collaborating right now. And Katie, what's your take on, on the, the chaos and, and what Trump's doing? Well, all I would say is all you need to do is think back to the transition of 2016, where he <laughs> okay. immediately fired the transition team. And apparently they just tossed all of the work, the papers, the binders, et cetera, that Chris Christie and crew had done. That was the start to me of a message of pure disdain for personnel. Um, as everybody knows on this panel, the most important task during the transition is to find personnel. And if you look at his record, he has had record-setting turnover at the most senior level of the White House. He's had record-setting cabinet secretary turnover. He's had record-breaking record record turnover in the E1 and E2 positions, which are the most senior positions in each of the departments. And right now there's a hollowed out government because he didn't fill many of the positions. So for him, this notion that I, I'm cutting sort or I'm somehow interrupting or disrupting a transition. What, what is that? I mean, to him, it's of no matter because he has never from the beginning cared about the importance of personnel, the respect for these individuals that serve the country. He of all presidents has fired more of his staff members than anybody else, just as to show you as another indicator of this disdain. And so it shouldn't be surprising. And I actually think that the Biden people were not surprised. I think they were anticipating that this would be rough they knew that they would be the nominee, the party nominee, probably by April, May. So I'm guessing that they did a lot of work in advance to try to do whatever vetting they could possibly do. And they came as prepared as they could, anticipating that there would be some pushback, that there would be some pockets of dissent, which there are. Elaine, if I could pick up on that really quickly, just to, to build on a point that Katie made about the, the vacancies and the real hollowing out of government. I was actually having a conversation with a friend a couple of weeks ago, and this friend is 
a very liberal individual. Um, and, and the person said, could things possibly be worse than what Trump has done? And, and I said, well, if you, if you don't like what the president has done during his four years, imagine what he would have done if he staffed his government. Now, <laughs> policy formation apparatus was at its fullest. Um, but he, he actually shot himself in the foot um, all along the way by leaving these agencies vacant. And while the permanent government goes about their work, the ability to form policy in coherence with the president's views is crippled when you have almost everyone in an agency in an acting capacity and the leadership through the agency and into the department is vacant or turning over quickly. Um, it's, it was a real problem for, for President Trump and he could have had a much bigger impact on public policy in the United States had he not done that. I, can I just add to that? He is, I think part of the reason he's lost in court so many times is uh, because he didn't say that. have yeah, yeah. the career, he, he didn't go through the right steps with the, you know, the civil servants know how to do this if you engage them, right? They know how to do it right, but he kept doing it so quickly that it ended up actually being easier to challenge. Yeah, Lisa, what I, I was just going to say that, I was just going to add in that in something I recently wrote, our regulatory tracker here at Brookings um, showed that of the 73 environmental um, changes that Trump had tried to do, almost all of them, was somewhat substantially more than half, failed. Either they were thrown out of court or they simply never got they never got to where they were supposed to go. And you're right, that that's what a sophisticated um, political operation and a sophisticated uh, career people can do. But by not having your political appointees in, you can't, you can't get into the minds, you can't get the sophistication and the can do of the career people. And uh, so, it, so this, is, this is kind of those half good, half bad, right? If, if you liked, if you wanted Donald Trump to do what he said he was going to do, you're really disappointed because he couldn't do a lot of it. And Elaine, and he did a lot from the White House, right? If you think about some of his immigration, that first, yep. the travel ban, that came out of the White House and surprised the State Department, right? If he had consulted his agencies, same point, he would have actually been able to write it in a way that would have been right. Yeah, right. exactly right. So, so if you didn't like what he was doing, you could be thankful <laughs> that he didn't put anybody yep. in the government. Let and me the other, oh, Yes, go ahead, Katie. And I was just going to say that the other thing in regard to personnel that's just a stark contrast from what Biden has done so far is I studied the backgrounds of the senior staff and I compared them to the backgrounds of other senior staffs. And the Trump people had far less prior government experience, which also feeds into this not only disdain for personnel, but a disdain for processes and the importance of all of those things in order to be effective. And so, you know, right from the beginning through his appointments, he sort of handicapped his ability to accomplish things. Well, and you know, it, it's interesting because when you do have a presidential transition, usually what happens is the party that's coming to power will reach back to the most recent presidential administration. So it's not surprising at all that a lot of people in the Biden administration were people who served in the Obama administration. It wasn't surprising that people in the, a lot of people in the Obama administration, like Lisa, had been in the uh, Clinton administration. However, an interesting thing happened with, with Trump, who, as we know, is, takes everything personally. The most recent Republican administration was the Bush administration. And Trump has a long and deep fight and animosity with the Bush family. So the, the pool of experienced people that should have been going into a Trump administration, either they felt uncomfortable serving this president or this president didn't want anything to do with them. So, well, let's move on to Biden himself. And, and let, me, let me ask all of you, starting, starting with Lisa, um, how's he doing? Okay, how has his response been um, to all the all the challenges before him, and um, how do you think he's is he on track when it comes to putting together his administration? Uh, what's going on? 
So, you know, people said that the Obama-Biden transition was the best ever. I actually think this transition is the best ever. I think to Katie's point earlier, they've started earlier. They are real professionals in how they're doing this. So the fact that I th they've that Biden has named more cabinet members, I think, Katie can check me here, than anybody else at this point. Um, and he's clearly... He's appointing people who know what they're doing. There is no question that he is valuing experience. And what he's his what you're getting a real sense of is that he want hit the message he's sending is we're professionals. We know how to make government work. We're going to get government working again for you. And I think that you can see that in the appointments that he's making. Um, and the, the other thing he's doing is he is living up to his promise about the most diverse um, administration so far. Um, I think that when you, and there are obviously a lot more appointments to come, um, but he's been, th that, that I think the themes in his appointments are experience and low key good people. I will say that too. You haven't seen a lot of, you know, sort of big personalities in this. And so you get a sense of these are people who are gonna, hit the ground running, be able to do their jobs on day one. Now, what you the flip of that is you're starting to see this criticism of sort of redux and wait, this isn't progressive enough. This is the same people all over again. And Elaine, as you indicated, every administration does to some degree draw, or to, except for Trump, on the, the last uh, administration of their party. So it's not unusual, um, but there he is getting criticized for it and he gets <laughs> experience. And he does, I think the other thing I would say is, we don't know what's gonna happen with Georgia, but if he doesn't get the Senate, he's also gonna be, there's going to be a constraint there that he's gonna have to face in terms of who he is able to um, get confirmed. Katie, Katie, I, you probably have data on some other transitions. Can you can you have data on everything? Can you talk yeah. about that? <laughs> so the White House Transition Project is also uh, is, is quantifying the pace of the transition in terms of appointments. They break it down, White House staff appointments and cabinet appointments. And it shows that Biden is well ahead of pace of his predecessors going all the way back to Carter. And again, I think it's a couple of things, the experience and the and knowing that he would be the nominee by late spring enabled them to sort of get things going in that respect. Um, I also have data that does show at this point, it is the most diverse cabinet. Um, you would have had to go back to, to um, Biden, I'm sorry, to Clinton to find the other diverse cabinet, but it is far more diverse. Um, of the 15 major departments, he's appointed eight of those individual secretaries. Um, so there'll be seven more. So it's interesting. There's all kinds of names that are floating around, but he's a little bit over halfway in terms of those major departments. Um, as Lisa mentioned, um, not only do you see, you know, the dominance of experience, um, but you also see more women and more minorities in these positions. Um, in terms of retreads, I just think that is the weakest criticism of all. Um, as you point out, um, the, the, the norm is to go back to prior administrations to get experienced people. So someone might move up from being a special assistant to the president to a deputy assistant or to an assistant to the president. And that's typically how you sort of move up and advance in politics. Um, you know, it's also the case that, that in some oral histories I've interviewed people and in, they've had prominent jobs in the private sector, but they will tell you that it took them six months to figure out what they were doing in the White House because the learning curve is so steep and so this makes perfect sense that we're in a moment of a major pandemic, racial tension, tension and economic crisis. We need leadership that knows what they're doing or at least can master that learning cur curve much more quickly than predecessors. I can, I can certainly agree with that. I mean, armed with a PhD in political science, um, I went into the White House in 1993 and wow there was a lot to learn. So um, uh, John, uh, talk a little bit about the cracks that are showing in this transition that might be important to Biden as he uh, starts to actually govern, uh, particularly the progressives, uh, the progressive wing of the party. Um, you know, last week there was a meeting with Biden and African-American leaders, and a lot of them were unhappy. They wanted Marsha Fudge to be the agriculture secretary, not the HUD secretary. I mean, there's been, there's been some of this brewing and some of it leaking out, although I must say it's much more disciplined than um, a lot of transitions that I've been involved in, including, by the way, the Clinton transition, which was just like Clinton all over the place. Um, but uh, John, 
talk a little bit about what's what's happening there and what tea leaves we can read about the upcoming politics. Sure. So I, I think there's really three areas in which the president-elect is going to be open to criticism, and, and he has been open to criticism um, already with regard to his staffing choices. The first is ideological. Um, are there going to be enough progressives? Are those voices going to be progressive enough to advance some of the values, some of the ideas, some of the policies uh, that other leaders in the party uh, want and certainly what some of the people who are responsible for the electoral coalition that brought Biden to office um, have espoused. We have a great piece from our colleague Vanilla, uh, Vanessa Williamson on uh, our FixGov blog that touches on this exact issue in Georgia. Um, the, the groups that got Biden elected in Georgia um, have been advocating for a lot of policies and Vanessa explores the ability of those uh, groups to get what they want from the Biden administration. So ideological is the first one. The second one, as Lisa touched on and Katie touched on, um, is this uh, tension between experience uh, and getting new blood into an administration. And every administration faces this tension and it's certainly one uh, that's popped up now. Um, and the last is this issue of diversity, which is particularly relevant um, for a democratic administration, but it's particularly relevant for uh, the president elect because he committed to um, a serious um, historic diversity in his administration, starting first uh, with his choice in a vice president and moving down throughout government as well. But I think the setting that we're in, the context we're in right now, really uh, minimizes two of those issues, uh, the I ideological one and the experience one. So starting with experience, uh, as I said earlier, we're facing multiple crises. We're facing um, a, a global pandemic and a massive recession. Um, and what Americans want is experience, people who know what they're doing. When they, for, for most Americans, when they look to government right now, um, you know, they don't want more Stephen Millers, they want more Tony Fauci's. Uh, and, and that I think is, is going to help um, Biden overcome this demand for an infu a massive infusion of young blood uh, and, and new blood into the administration. And I think too, given what we just talked about with regard to staffing uh, or, or understaffing during the Trump administration, I think that's an even greater expectation uh, for pr uh, President-elect Biden to, to focus on. Ideologically, that argument gets uh, diminished simply by the politics of the Senate. Um, no, at best, at best, um, Joe Biden is going to have a 50-50 Senate in Democratic uh, hands. It's probably more likely the Senate will stay in Republican hands. So his ability to get, um, maybe not Bernie Sanders, but Bernie Sanders type appointees into agencies is, is just limited. Even with that 50-50 Senate, it's hard to see people like Joe Manchin um, moving to, to confirm um, and accept people like that. And so that leaves open the president-elect to really focus on this diversity issue. And I agree with you, Elaine, the pushback that he's gotten so far has been fairly disciplined. And I, I think people are just essentially saying, hey, remember we're here and we're not gonna let, it, let things slide. Um, but his ability to do that now, that is, the, that is his focus. That's where he has the greatest room uh, to do what he committed to do. And as Katie said, um, he's doing it. We have empirical evidence that it has already happened and, and the likelihood is that that will continue. Well, and you know, I mean, you, you make a good point here. Between COVID and the likelihood of a Republican or at best tied Senate means that it, it's almost as if a lot of the intra-party tensions are, are gonna have to be muted mm -hmm. at least until 2022 when maybe something will switch in the Senate when hopefully uh, this, this pandemic is over. So I, it, we've got two years where I think uh, the normal tensions within the party that we're, we see a little bit of this in this transition are probably not gonna uh, be that important. Um, let me, before we turn to q and A, I, I wanna ask a, a question, which is, we are accustomed in America to this, this tableau. The tableau is the outgoing and the incoming president of the United States traveling together to Capitol Hill in a show of national unity. They are both on the podium as this as the transfer of power 
takes place. This is this has happened often. Um, who thinks Trump's going to show up at Joe Biden's inauguration? What, what are the bets? Katie, why start? Nope. It's not going to happen. I mean, he's already talked about launching a campaign at the very same time that Biden is being sworn in and having some sort of tarmac speech down in Florida. I don't know if he'll, you know, attempt to sort of steal the attention during that important moment in our history. Um, but there's just nothing. It's, I would be surprised if he's even conceded by then. I have a feeling we won't even get a concession speech. <laughs> John? Yeah, I, I'm with Katie on this one. I, I can't imagine a scenario in which he attends. Um, he His focus is on himself uh, and his own power and his own strength. And, and I think regardless of everything else, one thing that I, I think we can all agree on, Donald Trump has really enjoyed being president. Um, it, it, it fills something psychologically in him. And I think it does for most people who are elected to the office. Um, and so, you know, I think this is the equivalent of someone who really enjoys uh, weddings um, and, and the inauguration is his divorce hearing. Uh, and so he doesn't want to show up there any more than someone getting divorced wants to show up to a hearing to finalize it. And so I think he's going to be sunning himself on the golf course in um, Florida or holding a, a, a rally at noon on January 20th. But I don't think he's going to be anywhere near the U.S. Capitol. Lisa, what's your bet? I'm afraid it's unanimous. I can't <laughs> standing up there. I just, I, he, he, he can't ever depict him, allow himself to be depicted as a loser. And, and, and to what we were talking about earlier, he doesn't value the peaceful transfer of power. I mean, Elaine, I was so, we were talking about this earlier, you know, to listen to Vice President Gore's concession speech today, where he says, you have to put country over party, and where he then went and sat in the House while they were, you know, the votes, the Electoral College votes were coming in, and he was presiding, right? That In the I, Senate, in the Senate. Sorry, great, you're quite right, <laughs> um, was just another... So it feels like another era right now, although I'm hopeful it's one that um, we will get back to. Good. Well, I, you know, it's interesting. There have been other presidents who have skipped the inauguration. If Trump skips his, he won't be the first. Our second president, John Adams, is headed back to Massachusetts after the very contentious election of 1800, which, by the way, still makes even our recent bitter elections look kind of like uh, kindergarten, okay? And he lost that election to Thomas Jefferson. And then Adams's son, uh, John Quincy Adams, also skipped his inauguration after his defeat at the hands of Andrew Jackson in 1828. And then Andrew Johnson, the first president to be impeached, the man who had been uh, Lincoln's vice president, um, skipped the inauguration. He was definitely not welcomed at the inauguration since it was his own party that had tried to impeach him and the incoming president, uh, former General Ulysses S. Grant, uh, really hated his guts. So this has happened, but it has happened before. Um, and it has happened with presidents that have been pretty unpopular and pretty polarizing. So I guess there's a little bit of precedent there. I'm gonna now turn to some uh, Q&A. I wanna remind our viewers that you can submit questions for the speakers via email to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter using hashtag transition 2021. Um, but let me take a question that uh, had come in earlier while you're all uh, doing this. Um, and this comes from uh, Donald Palmer. And he asks, um, what changes in the law and the procedures governing transitions can be made to ensure that a recalcitrant president can't interfere with the process? And Lisa, being a lawyer on this, I mean, are there are there any changes that you think are realistic that could um, keep somebody else from doing what Trump is doing? So we've there's been a trend of more and more, right, Elaine, as you indicated with your opening, right, the fact that now there is a every agency has to designate a career official to be in charge of the transition for that agency. They're required to prepare briefing materials by within a uh, by a certain date and share it. There was actually a huge amount of work done by the agencies here. And my understanding is that for the most part, they are now sharing that um, with the Biden transition. Um, I think there are a couple things they could think about 
One is um, defining, trying to define ascertainment better and what would qualify for ascertainment or- At least a define ascertainment for- So the, the um, head of GSA has to ascertain the likely winner of the presidential election. And that ascertainment is what triggers the start of the transition. That is what held it up this time because she, she did not issue that, um, send that letter. And, or if you don't, if, if that's too challenging, you could also say, we wanna make sure that certain information is shared with the, even if you don't yet know the winner of the election, because this could happen with a, a genuinely contested election. Yeah. I understand it when during the Bush v. Gore litigation, President Clinton, as a matter of discretion, gave um, candidate Bush at that point, the national security briefings. He didn't have to, but he did. So you could, for example, say, if, there's, if it's still contested, you wanna make sure that both um, potential presidents are getting those briefings. So there are things like that that you could do. Yeah, Katie, any any thoughts on this? I'm wondering if you could make um, the GSA position a career civil servant instead of a political appointee, because it was pretty clear that Emily Murphy was taking some directions from Mark Meadows at all at the White House. Right. Um, interestingly, the tweet she released after she ascertained, you know, suggested it was her own independent decision, but it was quickly followed by a Trump tweet saying, thank you for, you know, working together, <laughs> 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 which completely <laughs> undermined her claim of being independent. But um, that strikes me as kind of an easy way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And also just being, as, as Lisa said, being much more specific about how you go about ascertaining and what, what bars need to be met before you can ascertain. Yeah, you know, that is that is really interesting because because when you think of GSA and the other things it does, it does really the it really has the administrative business of the government, real estate, a very important job, a very important agency, but not really a, a policy making agencies. So that that's real, really possible. Uh, John, what's your thought? Yeah, my recommendation was going to be exactly Katie's. I, it, it, GSA just isn't a political entity. The, the politics or the political part of staffing happens in the Office of Presidential Personnel. Uh, and so I think you're, you're probably not going to lose much um, by making that a career position. And anything that GSA does that a president might want to remain uh, having you know a political thumb on, you could probably move some of that out of the agency and into somewhere else. But my guess is m most presidents would be fine without having to pick a GSA head. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me go to another one from Dennis Lane, um, and it's his Dennis's perception that Biden that the expectations for Biden's transi transition team are higher than those of the current administration. And could anybody answer why? Uh, John, maybe start with you. Well, I, th I think the expectations for pre President-elect Biden were are overall are very different uh, than they were for uh, President Trump. Uh, what I will say though, is it, it's sort of an interesting, uh, it's an interesting approach because I think that the questioner is correct that those expectations are higher because he was vice president, because he has all, this years, all these years of experience in the Senate, including shepherding confirmations um, th through the Senate as judiciary chair and, and in other positions. Um, but, but I actually think it should be the flip. Our expectations should have been higher for Trump because of his lack of experience in government. Um, making that transition so, I'm sorry, that, that those staffing choices so much more important to his administration. I think, I think most people look at it and say, yeah, you know, Joe Biden knows how to be president. You might not think he's going to do a good job. You might think he's going to do a great job. You might think he's going to do a mediocre job, but he knows how to be president. Um, people didn't think that about Donald Trump um, during the transition. And so well, I think that those expectations are different between the two candidates. I think they're actually flipped um, compared to what they should be. Okay, um, Lisa? Um, I think that I completely agree that the expectations are higher. I think part of it is that President Trump um, 
he's never conformed to any of the expectations. And so people are so accustomed to that. They're just, they, they never expect him to be doing what you would expect for good government. And so it, it, it's a little bit like you've got, I don't know, apples and oranges, right? You can't even, you can't even compare the two. And, and because Biden has been in government for so long, there's this sense of professionalism coming back and they expect more of that. And they just never have, have they've come to expect less and less of it of President Trump. Katie? Yeah. And I would actually add that in some ways he's exceeded expectations. If you think about it, ever since the election, they have been very calm, collected, and they have kept their sort of nose to the grindstone with appointments. And they didn't, they, I mean, I thought maybe they would sue the GSA or somehow make some sort of public declaration of what the, why what the GSA doing, was doing was, was wrong. But they just sort of kept their nose to the grindstone and kept working away in a calm manner and an efficient manner. And they've accomplished a lot. They're way ahead of pace compared to their predecessors. Um, so I would say in the expectations game, maybe they are higher, but he's, I think he's succeeded them at this point. Okay, now here comes a question from R Roberta Stanley that I suspect there's loads and loads of people in Washington wanting to know the answer to. And Roberta, thank you for, for asking it. Um, and that is, how does one engage with a transition team? Lisa, you, you had the most recent. So, well, experience. so there is actually, if you get on their website, I mean, if you're interested in getting a government job and working in the administration, if you get on their website, they have a form and they're doing what every transition does and they are collecting um, names of people. Um, but I think the other thing that if, especially if you're in Washington, you tend to know some of these people and practically speaking, you know, the best thing to do is if somebody, you know, is nominated to be a cabinet secretary, you reach out and say, I'd love to work for you. Um, and that for working for the transition itself, that has been set for a quite a while. Right. So that, so the, what's happening now is there, you know, thousands and thousands of people who would like to help restore faith in government. And so they're, you know, doing their best to engage with the transition or with somebody on the transition teams um, to get their names into the mix. Yeah. And any thoughts, Katie? Well, I was going to say, I always heard the old joke that the transition uh, team, those were basically, it was an employment program for those who had worked on the campaign <laughs> so that they had somewhere to go <laughs> after the election to work until the government got started. Except but yeah, that actually, my, I, Katie, that doesn't actually happen. The transition, no. most part, the transition is set up as a, if you think about it, they started in April, March or April. It's set up quite consciously as a parallel process so that all the campaign energy can be spent focused on the campaign. Um, and there are some, there are absolutely are some people that then come over post-election. Um, but most of it is people that you've lined up long before because you don't, if you think about the agency um, review teams, you want people who know those agencies already, right? Talk about time not to, where you don't want any learning curve, right? You want people that can go in and talk to the career folks in the agency and know the questions to ask because they've worked there before, right? So they're really, there's more of a premium on prior government experience on the transition. And the thing that does happen is that there's, a goodly number of people on the transition go into the government. Um, and I think the statistic on the agency review last time was that about 50% did. So about half of the folks working on agency review teams ended up going into the agencies. Um, and then half went back and kept doing what they were doing before. You know, one of the, and John can talk a little bit more about this, but one of the things that we forget to realize about our modern federal government is there's a huge amount of expertise required. So just take a person who's very in the news right now, the head of the Food and Drug Administration. You know, the president-elect may love you. You may have delivered Cuyahoga County and won the state of Ohio for the president-elect, but you know what? If you're not a molecular biologist or a biochemist or uh, a, a guy who has a medical degree, guy or gal with a medical degree and a PhD, you can't be a director of FDA, <laughs> okay? And we have a very modern and sophisticated federal government, which means that there's just a lot of expertise needed and the people with those kinds of expertise are not likely to be found 
work it in campaigns. So that's the mismatch. John? You do traditionally, so I'd say one more thing. Traditionally, you do have a number of the campaign folks who work for the inaugural committee. Yes, that's true. That's this right. year, I don't know what that means because I don't know what type of, you know, I, I think it's going to be a far more limited inauguration. So, John? Um, yeah, I, you know, I think uh, one of the points that, that Katie brought up earlier is an important one to respond to Roberta's question about the transition. I think a lot of people outside of Washington think uh, inauguration day happens, the transition team ends and that's it. And you know, that's generally correct. Um, but the business of staffing the government endures. Uh, and so if you do, Roberta, if your question is sort of based on your own interest and you're interested in getting a job, you know, if, if you don't get outreach from the transition team by January 20th, only a, a very select number of those um, 4,000 political appointments are selected before the inauguration. And then all of that transfers over to the Office of Presidential Personnel. And so we think of the transition as a 78 day process, and it really is. But the transition towards staffing a government is actually a four long endeavor. It is, it's never ending. And so just as important as what the transition team does, I think uh, the president elects choice of staff positions in the Office of Presidential Personnel, including the director, but also deputies there are important. And I'll say um, as a sort of plug, if the Biden team is looking for someone to run OPP, there's no one better than Katie Tempest to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's, it's a critically important position that a lot of people don't know about. And that process of staffing is one that I think eludes a lot of people as well. Good. Well, I think uh, let's... Kathy, oh, I was gonna say, I think Kathy Russell has her, has her eyes on the office or has the job That's in right. presidential personnel. And she's been with uh, Biden for many, many years. So I'm sure she'll do a great job. And she was Mrs. Mrs. Biden's chief of staff. So if you know- Dr. Dr. Biden's chief of staff. Dr. Right. Biden's yes. chief of staff. And, <laughs> and so Roberta, if you know Kathy Russell, you're in, you're in good shape. Um, but you know, this, this does go back to the fact that one of the unique things about Joe Biden is that he's been in high office in the United States for decades and decades. Loads of people who's worked for him, loads of people that he knows. So I think they have a pretty good idea. Um, but as John said, you know, an administration is four years or even eight years and uh, people come and go, people leave for this reason or that reason. So, so don't give up hope for those of you wanting to go in. Um, finally, we have an interesting question from Jean Ann Mahan, who asks, what are the impacts of presidential powers in the post-Trump era? And I think this has kind of been a, a discussion a lot of us have begun having. Given the Trump presidency, are we just going to say, okay, that's over, let's, let's return to business as usual? Or are there things that we can see changing because of the sort of uniqueness of Trump's presidency? Katie? I definitely think we need to tighten things up. I mean, one I would cite right off the bat having to do with White House staff is the nepotism. Having your son-in-law and your daughter working yeah. as senior aides, that's, I think that should not be allowed to happen. Um, there are things that are gonna be more complicated and require congressional intervention. So for instance, when he used, he, fun, he took funds from the Department of Defense to, to, to build the wall at the border and did a lot of creative financing. There's been a great deal of abuse of the Vacancies Reform Act in terms of how long actings are allowed to stay in jobs. The DHS has had all kinds of legal gymnastics there to try to keep um, Chad Wolf at the, as the acting head. And it's, they've really gone to some great lengths to try to do that. So the, the Federal Vacancies Reform Act really needs to be tightened up as well. Um, I'm sure that, that things are gonna have to be done in regard to executive orders. Uh, I don't think Biden will have a problem with this, but you know, he clearly Trump has used the executive order and wielded that pen extensively. Yeah. Good, uh, John. What's your thought? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that that Katie just said. One of the problems, of course, that that we know um, from from the literature is that uh, every president excuse me, in some way or another, expands presidential power, it is very uncommon for presidents to return that power um, to, to where they took that from. I think there's a real opportunity and a real necessity um, for Joe Biden to think about ways to weaken the office of the president um, from where it is right now. And I think one of the most important steps that he can take off the bat 
um, is a strong signal to Congress about cooperation with regard to oversight and transparency. Um, what this um, president has done to the norms of uh, oversight, congressional oversight is disastrous for the functioning of uh, the government and for accountability within government. And I think it would be an important step for uh, the, the, the new president, uh, particularly actually if the Senate is controlled by Republicans to demonstrate that cooperation. If he's cooperating with Nancy Pelosi's house, it's not that big of a, of a, of a reach. But if he's um, cooperating across the aisle to signal that no, the president is not exempt from the requests of Congress, I think it's an important show um, of what he sees and what his theory is about the proper role of the presidency in our government. Lisa, you wanna finish this one up? Um, so I think that Trump has been more comfortable just plain disregarding the law and saying, come and make me do it in a way that others have not. I mean, I do think there's been a different standard in essence that's ended up being applied to him. And I think we're gonna have much more of going back to a norm of, you know, as John's talking about, you know, typically you have a conversation with Congress when they're asking for testimony or for people and you have accommodations. And I think you're gonna see a big difference with regard to the relationship with the Justice Department. I think you're going yes. to have it revert to what it traditionally has been where the Justice Department, the, is any communication, especially on an investigation matter, you don't interfere. The polit politicals do not interfere with investigations by justice. Any communication is through White House counsel. Um, I think you're probably going to continue to see use of executive orders. I think if we, especially if um, the Republicans hold on to the Senate, I think that is something that you will continue to see, but I think it will be done in a, um, a more thoughtful manner, engaging with the agencies before you issue an executive order so that it's then um, hopefully upheld if it's challenged. Um, so, it, but I do think it's going to be, I think we'll be much more back to um, being critic a criticism for not doing something, for not abiding by a certain requirement. And the, I think Biden's team will be much more sensitive to that than- Elaine, if I could if, jump in really quickly, um, something Lisa said um, uh, gave me a thought that one of the things that the new president can do also is exercise the powers of the office in a way that shows a marked change from how this president has exercised them. And I don't necessarily just mean overturning executive orders and this. I think in the next you know, five weeks, uh, we're in for a very interesting use of the pardon power. We've already seen an interesting use of the pardon power, but I think a lot of the president's friends and supporters are going to get um, pardons, perhaps family members as well. And I think one way that the um, new president could, could demonstrate, you know, these presidential powers exist, but they don't have to be used in perverse ways, would be very early on in January or February, to do sweeping pardons for nonviolent drug offenders in this country. It would be an interesting outreach to his base, um, the people who got him elected, but also to say, listen, the pardon power is there to do good and not just to help your friends. And that begins that process of restoring faith in government. And I think that restoration of faith in government begins with the exercise of presidential power. It's a great idea. It's a great idea, John. And of course the house voted um, in their uh, drug bill, which I think just last week voted to do that, but of course it died in the Senate. Yeah. Very quickly in the last couple of minutes, we have a question um, and you, you touched on it, John. So you, you go first, but be brief. What can Trump do in his remaining five weeks? We know that he can pardon people. Is there anything else that he of, of consequence that he can do in his last five weeks in office? Yeah, I think the pardon power is obviously a really important one. Um, and it, it, it also then creates limits on what type of efforts another administration and the next Congress can do in terms of holding individuals accountable. Uh, we, we don't expect much legislation to get passed. Um, and so we'll probably see the finalization of some more regulations on the way out the door. Uh, and certainly at this point, the exercises in uh, presidential power via executive orders and other memoranda, those are, those are only gonna last for a few weeks um, if they're beyond the pale. But I, I really think the pardon power is something that a lot of people are talking about, but don't appreciate how much havoc that can create in terms of the norms and function of our system. Lisa? 
What can he do? The other thing he's actually trying to do is he's tried to create a whole new category of civil service. So where he, people who've been in career positions who are uh, doing policy work, which is so broad, it can encompass thousands of career employees, that they could be let go as if they were political. And so some of the agencies, OMB included, have apparently identified a number of those individuals. If they are actually let go because on um, treating them like they're political, that is devastating at, at the beginning. Because if you think about OMB, which has phenomenal expertise, people yeah, exactly administration to administration, and you could rehire them, but all that is going to take time. And so I think that is a very dist- one another destructive thing he's doing right now, in addition to what John identified. Katie, you get the last word. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I think what Lisa was referring to is the Schedule F Schedule employees F. that they're trying to exactly. create at OMB, which there have been a lot of former OMB staffers who have signed a statement to the effect of how damaging that could be in the long term. Um, so I would agree with everything that John said and that Lisa said. And the only other thing I think to keep an eye out for are the Trump people that try to burrow into the government, yep. into civil servant positions. Yeah. And then at that point, try to wreak havoc. I think our government makes it difficult to do, to really wreak havoc one, inst- one individual but I think we should keep an eye on that as well. Great. Well, listen, with that, I wanna thank John and Lisa and Katie for participating. They all have uh, great and interesting careers and wonderful things to read. Katie and John and I will be writing about the transition, sort of some of the lesser known pieces of the government as the months go on. And I hope that you will join us at Brookings again. And thank you to everyone for participating today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.